Okay, so, so today, this week, all about relational databases and the sort of background to relational database technologies. Um, so let's just have a really brief recap on why the relational model, then into the details of what the relational model is actually composed of. I don't know what's in, what is it? Then we'll look briefly at some of the or some of the components that make up an RDBMS, a relational database. RD relational database. Oh my brain is giving up relational database. Management system. Yes, it's written the wrong way, isn't it? Relational data. No, it's not management system. Oh, just early mornings. Relay, yes, the components of a relational database management system. Don't know what happened to my brain there. And then we revisit the what is the relational model question briefly at the end. So this is just a little bit of revision from last week, remembering revision. So in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, we were working mostly in a system of a combination of ad hoc files, formatted files, which may be text, may be binary files, mixture of text and binary files, and then also the introduction of the early hierarchical network databases. So that was the situation in the 1950s and 1960s. And if remember some of the problems the needs, and to a certain extent, the needs are sort of the inverse of the problems. Uh, so the problems were that the data, the database, and the applications were all intimately entwined, particularly with these ad hoc uh, uh, file-based systems. You needed to know the structure of the ad hoc files, for example, to be able to access the data within them, and it was quite—it's a complex. Uh, and time-consuming process to uh, develop the systems. And that led to low programmer productivity. So the needs were for the data to become independent from the software. So we need to separate the applications uh, from, the date, from the particular database structure that underlies it and hopefully, to a certain extent, separate the data itself from the particular bit of software that the data is stored within. Because of the ad hoc nature, the different way all the files worked, the different uh, way that the network and, data and uh, hierarchical database is structured, the data was, data was not treated in a consistent and disciplined way. There were lots of different ways of doing the same thing, effectively. So it, we need... A, uh, a method, an approach, hopefully, that could treat our data in a consistent way and in the same way, a formalized way of dealing with the data. The data models, the ad hoc data models in particular, because they're effectively unique to each application, uh, it takes a lot of effort quite often to understand them. So we need a generic, easy-to-understand data model rather than all these ad hoc individual uh, data models. We need a powerful set of operators to help manage and query the data, preferably, and increase, and hopefully all those together will increase our programmer productivity. So that was the situation in the 1950s and 60s. Then, oh, indeed, the 70s. All oh, right, the oh, 60s. So, in 1970, E.F. Codd, who worked at IBM in California, published a paper in the communications of the American ACM, American Computer, something or other. It doesn't really matter what the thing. I put this paper. It's it's up on the um, study space. It's actually just about. It's actually readable which I think, if I remember correctly, some of these early papers, they may or may not be readable. You can have a look at it if you want. And in that, he proposed how 
He proposed basically the relational model or the, the, the beginnings of the relational model. And um, I've just taken that definition off Wikipedia. I know Wikipedia is not a deemed an academic, uh, a suitably academic peer-reviewed set of information. However, I think it's one of humanity's greatest constructions myself, and I think it's absolutely wonderful, although you have to take it with a pinch of salt, like you should take everything with a pinch of salt. Anyway, I thought they had a very reasonable definition. It's a digital database whose organisation is based on the relational model of data. Well, that's a tautology. It's sort of defining itself on the basis of a relational data based, based on the relational model of data proposed by COD in 70. This model organises data into one or more tables or relations of rows of columns with a unique key for each row. And that's about the most succinct definition I could get for a relational database yesterday. Uh, I couldn't find the sort of more succinct thing. So it doesn't actually come with a succinct definition as to what a relational database is. So it started in the 1970s with this proposal. It was just a paper. It was a mathematical um, idea or a logical idea. And the first relational database was released in 1974 called System R, and it was released by IBM, International Business Machines company that COD worked for. So the first commercial database, relational database, was on the shelves. You could buy it in the 1974. By 2015, if you look up a list of relational databases, there are presently hundreds, I would say several hundred at least, to choose from. Uh, different software implementations of the relational model. They vary from desktop implementations like Microsoft Access. Has anybody not come across Access? It's part of the standard Office suite or the Office Pro suite. It's basically a single-user desktop relational database application. And then you've got many more sort of large-scale ones. Some of these many, uh, we've got MySQL, uh, open source one, uh, Postgres, the one we're going to be using uh, in the first half of the, in this, this semester. And then the commercial equivalents, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle 10, there are hundreds of these things, varying in size, varying some that will run on USB sticks, some that require large uh, computers. So it is now, I would say, by far the most popular database model in the world. Well, as I say, I don't know what the percentage is, but it wouldn't surprise me if something like 70 plus percent, maybe 80 percent of databases in the world are relational databases now. So what actually is it, given that rather unhelpful definition from Wikipedia? Well, the components. But the rational model basically consists of three components. A collection of data structures that store, that allow you to store your data and access your, your data. Tables, columns, rows, data types, indices. These are all examples of data structures. But I'll go into some more detail in these. Data structures are things that allow you to store your data or indeed access your data quicker. A collection of operators that allow you to uh, access the data in those data structures, to create the data structures, to insert, alter, delete, and query the data. So a set of operators that work on the data structures. And also a collection of integrity rules. Integrity rules are about maintaining relationships between the items of data. So integrity rules are things like domains. I'll explain what a domain is in due course. They're, they're, they're acceptable values in a field, basically the relationships between data items, and also user controls, who has access to the information. Some people may have permissions to just view the data, others to update the data, others to, say, summarise the data. We can set a whole variety of 
user controls on the page. I hasten to add that COD's paper doesn't really deal with particular... COD's paper <coughs> deals with the underlying theory of how to connect the data in tables together rather than uh, this kind of approach, this kind of dis uh, decomposition of what the relational model is. So we're going to kind of run through those three items. Uh, not, we're going to meet data structures here and there, we're going to meet um, operators here and there, but we're going to sort of run through those, those three items now. So, data structures. All data in the relational database is stored in tables, or in the relational model are stored in tables. To make life awkward, or just historically, you know, it make it slightly awkward, a table in a relational database is called a relation. I always think a relation is between things, different things. And the, I, I, when I first met the relational database, I, I think most people assume that the relation is to do with the relations between the items of data. But the relation in the relational database actually is the term used by mathematicians and logicians involved, computer scientists involved in the underlying sort of maths and logic of uh, what they actually call what we call a table. Okay, so throughout this lecture and in future lectures, I'll be talking about relations, but I may also talk about tables. Occasionally, they're also called files or entity sets, depending on the, what database management system you're using. So the terminology can vary. So all data is basically stored in tables known as relations. So here we've got an example of a table, and I expect this is, you're all familiar with this, the idea of a table, very straightforward. We store, a table is consists of rows and columns. Uh, in the rows, sorry, in the columns, we store the, each, the, the attributes associated with the record, and the records are in the rows. In relational terminology, a row in a table is called a tuple. A tuple. And that, so a tuple contains a row in the database, it contains a record recording data about an entity. Each column is called an attribute or a field column attribute field, they're all synonyms, and they store the data about a particular attribute for each particular row. Okay, so this is a very abstract example. So this cell score stores the, the value for tuple 1, attribute 1, tuple 2, tuple 1, attribute 2, etc. And we quite often, a shorthand way of writing a table structure, to explain the table structure, is like this at the bottom, where you put the name of the relation, and then you list the attribute names just as a comma-separated list afterwards. And that's a shorthand way of writing the columns that are in the table, just to explain the columns in the table. So all the relational model is based on the relations, which are tables, made up of tuples and attributes. So here's a few examples. This is a simple uh, employee supervisor <coughs> database, excitement galore. We've got three tables, one called employee, one called building, and one called supervisor. And we can see in the employee table we have three fields, worker ID, the worker identifier, the name of the worker, and the skills skill type field. We can write that simply as employee, worker ID, name, skill type. We have a building table which has shares, also has a worker ID and also a building ID. And then we have a supervisor table over here that has a worker ID and a supervisor ID. And you can see that this shorthand, if you've got lots of tables, this shorthand is quite helpful for listing out the various tables and the various fields that you can 
see. So we can immediately see that worker ID is existing in all three field, in all three tables. So shorthand way of writing out the fields and tables. Relations have attributes. One of them is we call is what we call or the number of rows, the number of records in a, ta a relation is called its cardinality. So in this case, we've got five rows, five records. This seems to be a hospital database, patient number, last name, first name, sex, date of birth, ward number. So we've got five patients, one, two, three, four, five. That's our cardinality of our relation. The degree is the number of columns. We've got six columns. So this is a cardinality five degree six table. Very simple. Relations, or a, say a, a relational table, a database table, in general, the attribute columns are relatively static. They don't change through time. You design the database, you decide what fields you're going to have, and they pretty much remain the same throughout the existence of the database. You can add new fields, you can change what data type each field is, you can, you can alter them. But by alter, when you alter them, that may have knock-on effects on applications that are built on top of that database. So in general, with an operational system, you want a degree of stability in your column definitions, your attribute definitions, but the number of rows and their values can be highly dynamic, constantly adding new records, deleting up records, updating records. So in general, this is static, this is dynamic, but this does change. As needs change, if user needs change, uh, then maybe we need extra fields, maybe we need more information on, I don't know, uh, Maybe there's middle name, have no middle name field, so maybe we need some, a middle name field added so we could add that in a future development. Fields. So, say the tables are made up of fields, a number of fields. Each field stores one item of data of a particular type. And there are many different data types that can be put into a field. So we might store a Boolean value in a field. Boolean meaning true or false, yes, yes, or possibly three-valued logic, true, false, not known. Integers, whole numbers. Floats, decimal numbers. Text, could be time, and indeed it could be a geometry increasingly, and, and uh, in relation to spatial data, a blob, a binary large object, basically you're chucking some kind of binary, binary data into a field. So you can store lots of different types of data in a field. Each field can only store one type of data. So in our previous, so if we go up, so date of birth, if date of birth is a date field, we can't store and it's formatted like this, uh, day, month, year, we can't start typing the 25th of October 1977 in there as a text. It'll only store uh, in the uh, actual date format. So each field has a data type of a particular type. Fields also have a what we call a domain or may have a domain set, and a domain on a field is the set of allowable values in one or more fields. So you can define a domain on a single field, but you can also define domains across multiple fields as well. Uh, let's just shut that. Okay. So here's a couple of examples of domains. So say we had a percent field, a field that stored a percent between 0 and 100. We might store it as a float. Data type, 
and restrict the values so that they can't be less than a zero or more than a hundred. So we can only, so if I tried to type in a hundred and one, I would get an error message. It would reject it. So that's not within the acceptable domain. If we had a field for animal, it might store a string, and we might restrict it to a certain set of values. You can only have cat, dog, or hamster. Lion is not allowed. We have a telephone number. We might want to UK telephone numbers. I think I counted 11 digits in a UK telephone number yesterday, but my, I might miss calculated that. So we want 11, requires 11 digits to be entered into that integer field for a telephone number. And for another one example of postcodes, we want to make sure we have somebody enters a valid postcode when they're entering their address. Well, we can maybe look up that, the string that's been put up in a list of valid UK postcodes from the post office address file. That's exactly the same example, really, as, as the animal string example. So we can set rules that restrict the values that can be put into a field. In, uh, so this is a sort of extra level of filtering on top of the, just the simple data type. Fields have properties. Field properties are how you specify how you want the data to be handled, stored, and displayed, including the domain. So part of one of the field properties or a combination of field properties allow you to set the domain. Okay. But the field properties also cover other things like how the data may be presented, how it may be defaultly presented as a rounding, things like that. Uh, and the properties that are available <coughs> are dependent on the data type set for the field. So different data types have different properties. There are many, many, many defined data types. Well, perhaps not that many, many, but I don't know how many other in Postgres. Probably the standard Postgres installation maybe have wouldn't surprise me if it's got up to 100 different data types available as a standard install. Um, here's just a few of the commonest examples. Uh, text types, numeric types, date types, Boolean types, categorical types. There are many, many others. Time types, blob types, picture types, etc., etc. And within each class of type, there are sort of subtypes, so to speak. So, text. There are three different examples here, or three different types, data types for text in Postgres. There is one called car, one called varcar, and one called text. And depending on what kind of text you've got and how you want it stored, that's which, which one of these data types you want to choose. So the car data type, just car for character, is a fixed length string with a limit. So it goes, the n is a limit, and we'll go for this example. So this would be a string of, uh, say, 20 characters. Every entry in the database has 20 characters in that field. Whether they're used, whether they're full or not, they could be empty space if they're not being used. Varkar is a variable character length and basically allows you that the, the, the amount of data stored in that field will vary depending on how long the string is, up to a certain maximum threshold. And text is variable length without a limit, so you could have put the entire works of Shakespeare in a single field in storage in the database. Why do they have different uh, implementations of character data types? Well, it's all to do with efficiency. Uh, basically, the less, data, the less disk space you use, the quicker everything's going to be. So if you use a text, 
uh, a text field might, might well take longer to process than if you've got a character field, so it'll slow up your database. It's probably easier to see with the number example. So here's numbers, some examples of number fields. We've got a small integer and, a, and an integer. And in, a small integer is, uses two bytes of memory to store a small integer and can store numbers between minus 32,768 and plus 32,767. So if you've only got, if you know you've only, you've got, say, less than, you know, you're dealing with a situation where you're going to have 200 records or something, your number is only going to go up to 200, you can use it, store that, it, use the, uh, a small integer to store those values. And that will be quicker than using the integer data site, which uses twice as much memory, but allows you to store a much bigger range of numbers. So you need to know what range of numbers you're going to likely to have in your application. Then you choose the smallest data type that will store that information. Date types, we've got alternative views of versions of dates, etc. Et so different data types, different sub subtypes. These are different subtypes. Choose the one that uses the least amount of memory but that allows you to store your required information. Oh, here's just a couple of examples of those field properties just to um, explain the kind of things that those field properties contain. So here's two examples. Uh, the Postgres numeric field type data type, sorry, data type, stores decimal numbers up to 1,000 digits long. So that's probably enough digits for most applications in levels of precision. Up to 1,000 digits, but of course, usually you don't want 1,000 digits is way too many for, for what you need. So you can set, on the numeric data set, you can set two properties precision and scale on that data type, which kind of um, compresses the number of digits, reduces the number of digits that, that are stored in that, in that uh, field. So precision is the total number of digits that are being stored. So instead of 1,000 digits, you could just store 10 digits. That's probably far more reasonable. For things like um, latitude and longitude, for example, or for a GPS system, once you've got beyond about, I, I'm not an expert on GPS, but I think at about four or five decimal places on your latitude and longitude, it becomes meaningless. It's just noise after that. There's no more accuracy in that information. You're, once you've got within a plus or minus on a handheld GPS, what, well, plus or minus two or three meters. So, uh, you know, you, you, the most you're going to want is a, preci you know, a, a, a precision of maybe four or five figures. The scale is the number of digits after the decimal point. Okay, so if we put in a precision of 10 and a scale of 2, we could store up to 10, dig up to 10 digits, only two of which will ever be after the decimal point. So we're only saving to two decimal points of that. Varchar stores, stores characters, and n is the maximum number of characters that, it, that we could store in that field. So those are examples of some of the field properties setting domains. These are setting domains on the fields, on those data types. Null values. Fields may contain null values. And a null value is when we don't know what the value is. They're special characters unique to special markers, values uh, unique to each database that are crucially not empty strings in a string field, and they're not zero values in a numeric value. They are unknown. And there's a new, all databases have a special value to represent null values, it's usually the word null, but occasionally in some databases you also might come across the word none 
I can't remember, I thought my SQL used none, but and I was looking at it yesterday and I couldn't, it seemed to use null, so I was, maybe it was access that used none. You end up using all these bits of software over the years and you remember that once upon a time you, you had to type none rather than null, but you can't remember when it was or where it was. Anyway, so it's a usually null, occasionally none. And it rep these represent no data values. And if you've got null values in a field, they will have to be dealt with in a special way. Quite often they have to be dealt with in a special way. OK, so that's, that's the nub of the structures. We'll meet some more structures later on, but uh, that's sort of the basics of the relational structures. The relational data model is built on tables. Tables are made of attributes, rows, data types. Right. Okay, there are some constraints. When in a relational database system, there are constraints on the relations, constraints on how you can name uh, your relations in your relational database. So all relations or table names must be unique within a database. You can't have uh, different named tables within the same relational database. However, as we'll discover in, or you'll just meet in Postgres, Postgres and many other databases include things called schemas, which are effectively folders within which you can put tables to organize them within your database. And you can have tables with the same name in different schema. So it's like having the same file name in a different folder. It's exactly the equivalent uh, situation. But in general, you want unique names within the database. Um, actually, now I think about it, I'm not sure whether you can have the same name tables in a different schema. I'd have to check that. You might not be able to. Field names within a table or within a relation have to be unique. Not surprising there. Otherwise, the computer would be confused uh, as to which column you're referring to. Field values. The values stored in a field must be limited to a single data type and possibly may have a domain overlaid on it. It is important that in the relational model, the ordering of tuples, rows, and of fields in the table is irrelevant. It doesn't make any difference to how the table operates, how the relational database operates on the table. The ordering doesn't, that shouldn't matter. It doesn't have to be doesn't matter. And the other thing is that tuples, rows, must be distinct. Every mode must be unique. And how we define, identify the uniqueness of rows <coughs> is through the assignment of a row identifier, which we call a key. And we're going to meet keys in a moment. And if there is no inherent key in our data table, then we need to use something like the row identifier, a unique number for each row to give us a key. So, for example, if we had a table that just contained one column, which identified, you know, had a list of, say, A's, B's, C's, and D's, they would be not be unique. So we'd need an identifier row number, basically, for it to uniquely identify. Sorry about the huge amount of text on the, some of these slides coming up. Um, it's as much to remind myself exactly how these things are and to provide you with that, that, those definitions. So keys. So we'll deal with keys and then we might have a short, we'll have a short break after that probably. So in a relational database, a key uniquely identifies tuples in a relation in a relation. So it uniquely identifies rows in a table. Now there are different types of key. A super key, and we're going to have examples of this. So this is the definition slide, then we have examples. Okay, so, so please. It, it's, a super key is any combination of fields that uniquely identifies each row, fields, and by definition, almost all by tautology, fields in a super key cannot contain null values because if they could contain null values, you could have duplicates of null. Okay. 
So a super key, any combination of fields that uniquely identifies each row. A minimal super key contains the minimum irreducible amount of information required to uniquely identify each key. And we'll see an example. So you could have a key, a super key that contains more information that, than is needed to uniquely identify each row. Or you can, but, but a minimal super key is out of those super keys, the one that contains the least information that uniquely identifies a row. Examples coming up. Minimum super keys are candidate keys to be considered as the primary key. Okay. The primary key is a candidate key or a minimal super key that we select, that we choose, the one that we choose to identify tuples in the relation to uniquely identify the tuples. The remainder are alternate keys. And then we have a final key type of key, which is a field or set of field in one relation that matches a candidate key in another relation is called a Final definition we've got a key made from more than one column is a composite key. All right, that's your definition slide. Now let's see some examples to actually turn this rather. Uh, right word, but it's, certainly, I would understand if you've never seen keys before and look at that text. I don't think I understand it. Okay, keys for English kings. Here's a simple table name of the king, number, and their house. So Let's look at the keys. So, we want to identify the keys. So the first thing we want to do, we want to find a primary key for this table. <coughs> so the first thing we can do is list out all non-empty sets of attributes. So, we've got three fields, so we want all combinations of three fields. So we have name on itself, number on itself, each field alone. So each one of these is a combination of fields, non-empty sets of fields, name, and then we've got the duplicate, the, the, the pairs of fields, name and number, name and house, number and house, and name, number and house, all three. So those are the combinations of fields in that table. Now, we have to then discard any combinations that have non-unique values. Okay, so the field name contains three Edwards and one Richard. So Edward is clearly not unique. Throw that field set out. So these are the ones we're throwing out here. Number, similarly, we've got two number threes. Chuck number out. House. Multiple Plantagenet, Chuck House. Name and house. Well, name, house, we know there's duplicates in both those fields, Chuck it out. Name and number. We've got duplicates in name, we've got duplicates in number, Chuck it out. Then we've got, oh, so, so we've got name and number, and then we've got name, number, and house. We've got duplicates in discard all those non, non unique values. Oh no, we should keep name number house. Sorry, that's 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 that is an error on that slide. We keep name number and house. Yeah. We should be throwing out number and house. Number and house. Yeah. Oh dear. I've concluded that one. I've done an error on my slide here. We're keeping name and number. We're throwing out number and house. We, this should be name and house should be so, so cut out. And the remaining key sets are our super keys that contain unique combinations, unique rows. So name and number are all unique. Edward III, second Edward III, Richard III, Edward IV. So all rows are unique on name and number. They are also unique on name, number, and house. Okay? So these are our, potent, these are our super keys. These two sets of fields uniquely identify each row in our table. The minimal super key 
contains at least inf the least information, actually the least information that uniquely identifies tuples and our candidate key. And these are candidate keys. So in this case, number and house. Oh dear, I don't. Yeah, name and number. Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. There's just a couple of errors that come into the. So that should be number, number and name. That should be name and number. Sorry, this is terrible. Name and number. All right, terrible. Uh, name and number contains less than name, number and house. Okay. So this is minimal compared with this one. This just has an extra field. It has extra information that doesn't actually provide anything additional to what we have here. So it should be, in fact, name and number, not number and house, like number four. I'll correct those on the slides online. OK. So in this case, we've got only got one candidate key to be the primary key. We might have had more than one combination that contain roughly the same amount of information, in which case we might have a choice as to which one we use as our primary key. In this case, in fact, it is correct here, name and house, name and number, sorry, oh God, name and number, this is terrible, name and number, okay, is the primary key, and it is a composite fee key because it's made of two fields, the wrong fields in this case. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's the deliberate, deliberate act as opposed to... I'm a bit dyslexic, I warn you, actually. So, uh, or num I'm not a bit dyslexic, I'm just dyslexic. So my spelling is sometimes out, and I have trouble reading wrong words sometimes. So be warned. And I can put this down for that as well. <laughs> OK, so we've now got our primary key, which is not name and house, but name and number. Six, but this approach requires all possible combinations of value relationships to be present in the data set. So, what if there were two Edward IIs? Now, I know there weren't two Edward II, but you know, let's imagine an alternative reality where there were two rival Edward IIs. And the second is not yet in the database then we would have decided the primary key, name and number, on the basis of the data in the database, rather than the underlying reality of the world. So bear that in mind. This approach is a good way of under getting to the primary key from, the date, from a data, from when you've got the data ready available. But if you're capturing additional data in the future that you haven't yet got in your database, you might come across combinations in the world that are not represented in the data that you have. And indeed, in many cases, you don't actually have any data to start with. You're designing a database to enter data in from some project that's measuring the world. So this is all very well if you've got a data set available and a set of data to look at. It's great. But that isn't always the case. So just before coffee, we'll meet the world of functional dependence. And this is probably a more common approach for identifying a primary key in a field. So that was previously we've seen the sort of automatic way of going through a table. This is a common approach, the more common approach for identifying primary keys. And it's based on our understanding of the world rather than the data in a data table. And basically, it works under the, prom the premise, if A, then B. And again, some rather wordy explanations for this. If we have a value for attribute A, do we know that we will always be able to find at most a single value for B? If so, B is functionally dependent on A and A functionally determines B. Put it in another words, B function is functionally dependent on A if each value of A determines one and only one value of B. And in this case, A is a candidate K key for this relation. As always, an example helps. Here's a student table, functional dependence. We've got student number, S num, student name, S name, uh, SF names, first name, DOB, date of birth. So 
In this case, S num, the student number, you want K number. If, you've got your, if I've got your K number, because all K numbers are unique between students, I can access your name, your first name, your second name, and your date of birth. So therefore, all the other the fields in this table are functionally detem determined by S num. If I know S num, there's only one name, surname associated with F with S num. There's only one first name associated with F num. There is only one date of birth associated with S num. So therefore, S num can be is a candidate key. We could use it as our primary. Conversely, if I have a date of birth, if I have a, let's say a surname, Smith, I cannot get a single number, KU number or S number, if I have a surname Smith. Yep. So therefore, S num is not functionally dependent on S name. And of course, this situation exists in many, many situations in, the, in, in our lives, your passport number should functionally determine the information of who you are. So you should your driver's license number. So any kind of unique ID, basically. Is what we're looking at. And this is how the identifying, by identifying functional dependence is a more common way of identifying and determining primary keys than actually going through a data table like I showed previously. Oh no, we'll just do foreign key. Let's see, let's just see. And key questions, keys and constraints. Uh, okay, we'll get down to database design and then we'll, we'll have a little break there. Okay, we'll just finish keys. Okay, so those are your, so we've got a primary key in, our, in one table now, which is, allows us to uniquely identify the rows in that table. But relational databases are made up of many tables, many relations, and we need to connect the data that are stored in those different relational tables. And we can do we do that through foreign keys, which link to primary keys in a table. Foreign key, one relationship that relate to a primary key in another relation. So here's an example. Well, let's have a definition. A foreign key is a field in one relation that contains values matching those of the primary key of another relation. And it allows the separate, separate relationships, the data in the separate relationships to be joined, relations to be joined. So here's an example. We've got one table of vendors and one table of checks. Checks being, I think it's an American example, being, you know, check, you know, as in uh, money is due, as in dollars. And then we've got want to combine these so we know which vendors, we know, want to know what transactions have been made with which vendors. This is a list of unique vendors, this is a unique transactions, and we want transactions by vendor. So vendors has a primary key, vendor ID, in this case it's a numeric one, oh, sorry, an alpha, alpha, alpha numeric identifier, not a good choice in database design because text takes more space to, to store than integers. So they should have had an integer identifier, but that's a, a pedant talking here. doesn't really matter. So vendor ID A is the Adams Corp, B is the Belty Inc., etc. In the checks field, in the checks to relation, we also have a, our primary key is called check here and is incremental by each each, um, each transaction. So we have a new transaction, we enter a new row called number six. We also have a field also called vendor ID. Usually most foreign keys are given the same name as the name as the primary key that they match in the other table. That just makes life easy. They don't always have, they don't have to have, but they usually do just to make it clear that they, those two fields match together. So check one, was to vendor ID B, had a date, had amount. Check two was to vendor ID D, date, amount. Third one was to B as well, date, amount. And what we do in a, when we do a join, what's called a join in a relational database, is we match the records between the primary key 
in one table and the, the, the uh, foreign key in the other table. And we unsurprisingly get an output table, an output relation, which combines those data. So we now have check one, vendor ID B, and then we've got the name of that vendor that's come from the vendor table because we've matched them on the vendor ID equals B. Quite straightforward. Is that straightforward? Yeah, good. So the foreign keys allows you, is a table in a, another relation that allows you to match records onto a primary key in the first relation. Yes, the primary key must never repeat. We're going to go on to the constraints on the foreign key. So you're just slightly ahead of us there. But yes, yes, I think what you said exactly. So we just have a key questions. A candidate key, so let's have a quick go on this. The candidate key is selected to identify tuples uniquely within the relation. It's called the primary key. Yeah, yeah. The candidate keys that are not selected to be the primary keys are called the alternate keys, yeah, and a something key is an attribute or set of attributes within one relation that matches the candidate. Murmurings, foreign, yes, foreign key. Okay, uh, yeah, we'll just get down to database design and then we'll, that's a good place to stop. I'll have a little break. Keys and integrity constraints, this is the very thing that you're jumping onto. So primary key is used by the R radiation database management system to ensure each tuple is unique, each row is unique. Primary keys implement unique, oh, this has gone italic, <laughs> it should be underlined, unique and non-null constraints. So a primary key, every entry must be unique. You can't have duplications, like you said, and also you can't have null values in a primary key. We said that earlier. Foreign key is used to enforce referential lookup integrity. Quite a mouthful. And foreign keys implement the, these constraints. The value must match a value in the primary key field of the linked relation. So you can't, we can't put X, vendor X in here because there's no vendor X in the list in the pri associated primary key. So it prevents us putting values in this column that aren't present in this in this column here. Okay. Oops, wrong way. Also, but you can allow null values in a foreign key. So we could have no a null value in the foreign key field, so we didn't have a vendor associated with a sale. Okay, that might be not logical from a vendor from the perspective of the domain, the application of a you're selling things to people, but as a general principle, you can have that. So you can have records in the foreign key relation that have no associated record in the primary key. But you can't have entries that don't match an entry in the primary key. Why do we do this? Well, it's to maintain what we call referential integrity. So here's a rather, I don't find this is a very uninspiring example, but that's life. Um, so we have an artist, this is a record database, we have a tuple of artists, one, two, three, Bono, Cher, and, and you know Betancourt, I have no idea who that is. And we have some albums here in another table, we have a, a, our album ID, our primary key, here's our foreign key, and in this case we've got an album called Eat the Rich, uh, which has an artist ID of four. But as you can see, we've got no associated artist ID of number four in this database. So if we search for this album, we can't basically you can't have an album without an artist in this case because this there is no associated record here. We've got this broken link. So this is what the referential, the use of foreign keys is preventing happening. It's preventing us entering albums into our database here, which don't have associated, which don't have a artist associated with. So we can't put a load of albums in that don't have uh, artists in the database. Okay, let's take 10 minutes.
try it, three of them, five minutes. So, uh, and finish off. So let's come back, at, meet up at 10 past, let's get a breather for 10 minutes, and we'll do that.